Okay, so uh, welcome to Docker for Devs. And to get started out, by raise a hand who's used Docker before, kind of missed that. All right, so just a couple of you. And a uh, lot of experience, little experience, kind of a little bit. Okay, well, we'll start from the beginning and we go pretty far. So hopefully I can be able to answer any questions we might have. Um, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing is kind of what is Docker? So uh, from a technical point of view, Docker is a para-virtualization technology. Um, what para-virtualization does differently in virtualization is that instead of trying to uh, redirect calls at the uh, opcode level in assembly, instead it's redirecting system type calls. So when you say file to open, it's, your, it's getting a, a redirected file open. You still think you're doing things on a regular operating system, but instead the operating system is redirecting those, those calls. And the same thing for the networking or uh, the file system and uh, et cetera. So uh, para-virtualization is kind of what this is all about. <clears throat> Another thing that's kind of really helpful about this is Docker images are what's known as stacked, and we'll talk a little bit about more when we get to the notion of images, but basically this is all thanks to a technology called OverlayFS, which allows us to take uh, different commits and base upon them uh, to make our own images. Uh, it's built upon Git for image management, so when we use terms like commits and push and pull, those are all should be synonymous between Docker and Git because they're the same thing. Um, and kind of a little known fact, uh, the underlying technology for Git actually was meant to be kind of a file system. So uh, it's not using it in kind of a weird way. This is how it was meant to be used. Um, it's easily deployable. So uh, that's one of the big advantages we get. And another big one is uh, platform portability. Uh, more on that uh, later. So kind of a why a Docker. So the images are kind of cool because they're all self-contained. So uh, there's no, no dependencies to install, there's no, uh, you know, manual processes to get these things going. An image has everything it needs to run and do its thing. Um, they're very lightweight, they're very scalable. Uh, you can, t from an image, you can create a new container in a matter of moments, seconds really. So uh, spinning up or tearing down containers is very, very fast. Um, it works very well, dovetails really perfectly with microservices uh, and the ability to kind of dynamically expand and, and reduce based off of the amount of load. Uh, another real big thing is we can have the exact same platform in our dev environment and production environment. Now what I mean by that is in our dev environment we can actually be running our dev inside of a Docker instance, debugging through the Docker instance and all those kinds of things. When we're done with that image, we know it's going to run exactly the same way in production. Um, but the cool thing about doing it in the dev and the Docker images, uh, for example, I tried to contribute to a project just a couple weeks ago where I, I pulled the Git, I installed all the dependencies, I opened the project, I ran, tried to run the solution, and I got air screens. And I never figured out exactly why. I did figure out why. I didn't figure out why at the time. Uh, and, you know, it derailed me for an entire day. Whereas if these things were happening in Docker, I would just pull, build, and then run. And there would be no, there'd be no opportunity for problems to, to creep in. Uh, and in that particular case, it was actually, I had a newer version of a framework installed than I was expecting. So another thing that Docker guards against. Um, and then orchestration. And orchestration is just simply the notion of uh, starting up container on whatever server uh, during either when, when we're starting or deploying a new one or uh, load scaling, all that stuff is that kind of is all under nested orchestration. So, a little bit more on the difference between a virtual machine and a para virtualization para virtualized container. So, on a virtual machine, I've got these copies of guest OS. These copies of OS are, for all intents and purposes, redundant because we do have a host operating system uh, executing here. But they require memory. They think they're in charge, so we've got, so memory gets uh, redirected several times. We've got some overhead associated with both having the guest OS load in memory and how it's operating, and that gets pretty expensive. And then on top of that, we have our 
binaries and libraries, and then on top of that we have our apps. And uh, we call these binaries and libraries dependencies. But uh, yeah, I mean, they, they're very well isolated from one another, so that's it's a very nice and attractive feature. They are uh, hardware independent. That's a very nice feature. I can take this guest image and I can put it on a different hypervisor. Um, so that's very nice. I can manage them easier. There's a lot of advantages to having uh, a virtual machine. But para-virtualization is a, a bit nicer because instead of having these guest OS layers, I don't need them at all. I simply have this really thin Docker engine that simply redirects calls as they're made from the apps and libraries uh, to the operating system in a manner that uh, is appropriate for that container. Uh, and a lot of that's configuration, but a lot of that is just kind of how containers are isolated. But we still have the same separation between app one and app two. If I'm in app one and I try to see any, anything that's happening in a different container of app two, I'm not gonna see anything. They're completely isolated, just like they were in the hypervisor. Um, so we get the same kind of isolation, we get the same kind of portability, we get a lot better performance, a lot better resource uh, utilization, a lot less waste. So they're really kind of a great combination of, of features. Any questions on this? Yeah. So what about like the .NET framework? Is that, I, I'm assuming that's included in the live? Correct. That would be kind of one of the dependencies. So the whole framework gets dropped in in a Docker image? Right. Other questions? Okay. Yes, question. Just assuming it's the whole framework that you need. Mm -hmm. If you need just right. a .NET Core, then just the core goes in. So it's so, so. whatever you're building your image with is smart enough to only pull in what the app is using? Yeah, so that's the advantage of the layers. So a, a typical advantage, uh, typical layered approach would be uh, let's so we'll, we'll take the Windows stack. So let's say we're using Windows Server Core as our base image. Windows Server Core has nothing installed, nothing at all. It is basically the, the most minimal version of, of Windows you can have. On top of that, you could base your image and say, okay, I want .NET Framework installed on this image. In fact, they already have those at the Docker Hub. So let's say, okay, well, they already exist. So I've got, there's a container out there that is uh, ASP.NET Core 2.1 that's based off of the same uh, Windows core. Now let's say you want to create your application and you're just a regular application that works on top of that. You base your image on top of that ASP.NET image and then the only files you're saving is the files for your app. That dependency is because it's a, an image, it can be shared across multiple Docker images. So when we're talking about like a deployment of an app, it's usually in a neighborhood of like two to 200 megabytes. It's a really small amount of data we're talking, simply because it's just the files required for your app in a typical scenario. Uh, and even if you have other dependencies, so let's say you've got a dependency on, oh, maybe you need some other things installed on, on top of maybe some reporting or something. You can base an image off of ASP.NET Core put the reporting stuff on, then base your image off of that. Then anytime you have that reporting uh, required for other applications, you can use that base image and it gets completely reused. So yeah, that's the advantage of the layered file system. We'll talk a little bit about more when we get to that slide. Um, so uh, here's all the kind of components and these are, these are specific to Linux because Windows is a bit more black box, but Windows is gonna have all the same analogous things. But there's a, the overlay file system. Uh, that's going to help us out because it's going to uh, provide these layers that we, we're talking about. Um, we have uh, libvirt and lcx, which provide some of the containerization. Linux namespaces is uh, isolation for those groups. Uh, we get virtual and shared network interfaces and mounts. So there's virtual and shared mounts. So in Linux now, all these things have now been actually adopted into the Linux kernel, which is a good thing. That means that pretty much any distro of Linux is going to be uh, compatible with any of these technologies. And in fact, we can take a, <clears throat> let's say our host is running Debian, we can go out and fetch a, an image that's based off of Fedora and have that image run on top of our Debian, but it's running Fedora. So a really kind of neat way that 
that all kind of works together. Um, and like I said, Windows has all the, the same kind of isolations and things. They just don't name them all. We just call them containers. So, questions there? Okay. So, uh, what is an image versus a container? This is a very confusing thing at first for people. Uh, and the way to think about it is an image is simply just a file system. It's There's nothing there yet. There's nothing running. A container is dependent on, is based on an image, but it's an actual running instance. It's got its own uh, copy of state. It's got, if we change changes to a file system, those are stored in the container, not the image, uh, unless we check them back. <clears throat> but the containers kind of you thought of like as a running version of the image. An image, though, can be shared or pushed or uh, moved or deleted or tagged or whatever, uh, but the, the real thing that's actually running is a container. So does that make sense? Okay. So speaking of containers, um, the first thing you do is uh, basically work with what's called a Docker registry. And what a Docker registry is, is it is kind of like a GitHub for different kinds of images. So we talked about like Windows Server Core images and ASP.NET images. Those are all housed in Docker Hub, which is a Docker registry. There's also kind of Docker Store, which is Docker registry. You can also put up your own Docker registries if you want to keep like your own images for your corporation. Um, but uh, that's what a, a Docker registry is, so hit that again. So the typical workflow here is <clears throat> what we're going to do is we all start, this all starts with a Docker file at some point. A Docker file describes what the image should have in it should look like, describes an image. We then build that image into our local Docker instance images repository. We can tag them in this repository, then we can push them to Docker Hub, which is a Docker registry, or we can pull them from Docker Hub, which is a Docker registry. We can export them as kind of a backup, we can load them as a backup. Uh, I will tell you though, it's much better to push to registry and pull from the registry. The reason being is uh, when we use this save and load, this is going to save and load all the layers of the file system image rather than just whatever ones have changed. The neat thing about the push and pull is if I base my image off of something that Docker the registry already knows about, when I push it, it's only going to push the changes, um, just like in Git, right? But if, if I'm kind of pulling it out of Git, as it were, then I get the entire thing. So if I have something based off Windows Server Core, then based off ASP.NET, then based off my own application files, all those things are included as part of that image export. So that's not usually what you want to do. But once I have this kind of repository of images, I can run them, and then I have a container. So remember, a running instance of an image is a container. I can start, stop, restart them, and commit them back to images, and that's everything I can do. So that's kind of Kind of Docker in a high level. We're going to go into more uh, things and some demos, but any questions about kind of any of this state flow here, workflow here? Awesome. So uh, I'm going to show you some commands and then we're going to actually run them. Live demos being the funnest of risk in any presentation, right? <laughs> okay. So it's pretty straightforward. If we're going to pull an image from a uh, registry, we say Docker pull. If we don't prefix it with something, it assumes we want Docker Hub. If I run, want to run an existing image, I can say Docker Run. If it doesn't have the image, it'll automatically pull it for me, so that's kind of handy too. If I want to show the running list of containers, I do Docker PS. Uh, if I just want to look at, for one of the images, I can do Docker PS and either give it a partial name, partial GUID, and it'll give me all the ones that match. If I want to attach to a container, there's Docker Attach. Uh, if I want to stop a container, Docker Stop. I want to show all the images, Docker images. Uh, there's also <coughs> lots of others. I can do Docker RM to remove a container, Docker RMI to remove an image, um, lots of others. So let's do our hello world thing. So I'm going to just follow a script here to make this nice and safe and easy on me. But what we're going to do is do uh, Docker pull, Docker wellsy. So the Docker slash basically saying this is going Docker red, uh, Docker registry. And then, sorry, well say. Then I want the well say image. Then I'm going to say docker run. I want that same image. This parameter here is going to be what 
I'm going to execute in the image, and this parameter here is going to be an optional argument that I can pass in. Uh, then I'm going to show that I have the image, and then I'm going to show I have container. So let's run that demo real quick. So I'm going to hopefully not ruin anything by trying to run something. Yeah. Is that we're here now? Okay. All right. So I'm a little bit typing in the blind, but I think I'm good enough for this. So let's do Docker pull Docker slash whale say. Did I get that right? Awesome. Let's see what happens here. Okay. I've already downloaded it. It has a neat little animation when downloading, but not a biggie. Okay. So next, I want to do Docker run Docker slash slash no stop. Well, say cow say. Okay, did I get all that right? Yep. Okay. Nope. All the all the things after the the uh, is parameter. So, and I get this neat little neat little hello world. Well. All right. So now I want to do Docker images, and I should see that among my images is our nice docker well say right here docker well say and let's see a little big let me shrink this a little bit there we go and last but not least docker ps so I can see the running containers oops I don't see the container I'm looking for so the reason is docker ps is giving me running containers by default that container ran and then had nothing else to do so it, it stopped executing so when I have a container that has a process that stopped executing all the processes in that container stopped executing it automatically stops the container which makes sense right if I want to see that though I can do docker ps minus a and I can see that I have at the top here ran about a minute ago this cow say hello world so there we go Live demo and actually worked out great. <laughs> so let's uh, close that for a minute. Okay. So, <clears throat> like I, s I mentioned before, and we'll get into a little bit more of this. In order to build one of those images, like the well say image, that all comes from what's called a Docker file, and we use Docker to build a Docker file. And a Docker file is just going to describe what steps that Docker engine needs to, to run in order to build that image. So uh, I have an example here. So let's do that. Let's see. <coughs> Where is... Uh, let's see. I've got... And you can see what I'm... Okay. I've got a Docker file here, <coughs> courtesy of Dan. And let me see. Control plus. <laughs> it looks great, man. Okay. Is that big enough you can see it? Yeah, it's pretty big. Okay. So let's go through this real quick. Um, so almost always, one of the first things you're going to see in these uh, Docker files is this uh, this from directive. This is saying what container I want to base my image off of. You, like I said, you don't have to do this, but almost always you're going to want to do this. Uh, at the very least, you're going to want, you know, what operating system base you're using. So yeah, almost always you're going to see this uh, from. And so I'm going to what it's going to do is going to take that image and I'm going to apply my changes to it. So the next thing it has here is an argument for disable rabbit management. So just like on that uh, Docker well where you passed in the parameter of hello world, this is allowing us to pass a parameter of disable rabbit management. That's expecting that parameter. Um, this is another thing that you'll typically see at the top of these Docker files is what shell you want it to use when it needs to execute something. This one is currently commented out, but we could say instead of command.exe, please use PowerShell. Yeah. Uh, why is it coming out? Because currently on Windows, whether using PowerShell or not, it's using command. 
So when you say you want to use PowerShell, all it's doing is invoking PowerShell from the command, which is then invoking your command, and that's kind of a pain. Also, uh, not necessarily for this particular image, but PowerShell would be very helpful if I needed to download something. Uh, although, we can download things. Uh, the add command we have here, while we're adding a local file in this instance, we could just as easily put a URL there, and it'll download that URL and put it where you tell it in the file system. So in this command, we, we're t saying, I want to take this Erlang cookie, and I want to put it in this directory on in my image. So C data Erlang Erlang cookie. Okay, so I skipped over to run this. Oops. Oops. Pardon. Here we go. I did skip over this command, so let's talk about this one. So this one, I want to run something inside of that container. So the container build is kind of an interesting process. It's not simply a thing where I specify the parameters and tell it to build, and then build is done, and we're done, and we have our container. It's actually going to go through a lot of intermediate steps in order to get that container. And that's actually a good thing, because what that will do is, uh, if I haven't changed parts of my Docker file, the next time I build it, it's going to recognize, hey, this command, I've already got an image that's going to, this is already run, and it's got an image in the meantime. So each command it does is going to have a different image associated with it. So every step is going to create an image along the way. And I'm only really going to keep and tag the one that I end up with at the end. But uh, it allows us kind of yada, yada, yada through the build process if we change something at the end, right? Because um, building can take some time, as you might, as we'll, we'll see. Um, but yeah, we're running this PowerShell, and what are we running it here for? Let's see. Okay, so yeah, this is to download Chocolatey. Um, down here, we're setting a work directory. What that does is it kind of sets the current working directory. So when we say add, and we don't specify on the other side, it's just going to kind of add it there. Um, this is going to run a command on the container. So it's going to say make a link from Erlang cookie to this other Erlang cookie. Yes, Dan? Why does that run a command look different from the previous one? Uh, oh, okay. So uh, yeah. This one is in a different syntax. There's two run syntaxes. Uh, this one is basically going to pass all of this off as kind of a single parameter. This one is a little bit more powerful in that we can specify this is the command I want to run, and this is the parameters I want it to run. So um, also, this one is going to use the default uh, run that's this file. The default shell that was defined. Thank you. Uh, and this other one is not going to assume that there's any default shell running this command. Yo. I was just going to say that, that line 22 is why we're not switching to PowerShell. Oh, right. Cool. All right. Um, next, we're going to run Chocolatey to install Erlang. Uh, this, these ENV. These create environment variables for the image. Um, environment variables are a very kind of central notion in Docker. They are how we essentially tell Docker what kind of persona it is. Uh, so let me give an example. So these these are for Erlang to function properly, right? If it doesn't have these environment variables, it can't function correctly. But we also use environment variables to pass arguments to things, and the reason is. Uh, we want our container to run exactly the same way, whether it's it's over here or over there. And the Docker engine is set up such that the only thing that can that changes between these two is those the ver the uh, contents of those environment variables. So by taking the same exact image and running over here, because environment variables say I'm a dev, I'm a dev, I'm a dev machine, it's going to hit your dev database and your dev stuff. It's going to act dev. Uh, when we move it over to production, it's saying production, 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 point to real database, and all of a sudden our image is now pointing to production. The exact same image between the two, it's only the configuration as kind of as environment variables. And environment variables is kind of handy because you don't know what machine it's going to run on, you don't know where that's going to come from. It's kind of the best way to kind of communicate to that, uh, that host process. This is kind of the thing. Also, note that these environment variables that we're specifying here, they are constrained to just that container. Nothing outside of that container can see these or do anything with them. So, 
environment variables. Okay. Uh, let's see. Then we're going to run more chocolatey. So uh, this volume command right here, this is going to perform a volume mount. Uh, now, I'm going to say something that's probably going to be confusing, but uh, these commands right here, this volume and expose, these are more documentation at this point than anything else. The reason is uh, volume maps and what ports to expose the, the network uh, configuration, that's a detail for the container, not for the image. And remember, a Docker file, we're describing how to build an image. So these commands actually do nothing. If I have them, if I don't, they do nothing. Uh, but they are helpful for someone who's going to come back later and actually use that Docker file. To, it's going to be helpful to know, oh, I'm going to need to expose these ports, otherwise this thing isn't going to run properly. So, uh, And then last but not least, uh, every image must have what's known as an entry point. An entry point is going to be the process or command that's running that uh, if it dies, then the container dies as well. This is the long running process, or, or this is the, the application, the heart of the application. Uh, so if if I attach to this particular Docker instance and I say exit on the command.exe, that's the entry point here, that container is shutting down. It stops. So also when I restart that container, what's going to run is this entry point, this command.exe. So this is very kind of pivotal to starting and stopping of containers is, is that entry point. Okay, so that's a Docker file in a nutshell, and there's pretty much every feature inside this one. Is there any questions? Yeah. What are your uh, other options for entry point? Is it pretty much the sky's the limit? Nope. In fact, it's very limited. You have one thing you can run, and they understand that that's kind of a limitation. So I think they are working towards you know multiple entry point style Docker uh, for Docker. But no, you can have just one command here, and that's it. The one command could be a batch file that sparks other things. That's true. However, um, that will work for starting it, but for automatically stopping it, that won't work. Because even if those all stop, that entry point command is still running. Yeah? So my, my point isn't running parallelized processes. My point is that one entry point could be anything. It could be command.exe, it could be the .NET CLI helper, it could be chocolate, it could be whatever. Right. You get one. Okay. Okay. Any other questions about Docker files? Cool. Uh, so let's go back to the slides now. Okay. So let's talk about uh, image repositories a little bit more. So, like I was saying, we there's t only two ways to to share an image. There's pushing it to a registry. Sorry, I said repository, I meant registry. Image registries. There's pushing it to a registry, and then there's kind of an export. And out of those two, like I mentioned before, you really want to have the registry. And it's really not hard to get a registry up and running of your own. Essentially, all you need to be able to do that is you need to run a registry server, which is available on Docker Hub. And you need it exposed in such a way that you can get to the network endpoints. Um, and that's it. Once you've got that, uh, you can then push and pull from it. The way we do that is in the docker tag command here. So let me show you. So this part right here, the server, that's where we're going to specify the DNS name or IP address of our uh, server. By simply tagging that image with that prefix, uh, we, we get the ability to push to that. So after it's tagged, I can just say docker push, and then I put that full name with the server. So the server plus slash name. I put that full name in the docker push, and it'll push a new version of that image over to the docker server. Um, and I'm not going to demo that because that's essentially it right here, but it's, it's really not that bad. Uh, another common thing that you'll probably see throughout, though, is uh, almost all the docker commands have a notion of uh, we want to reference what image we're talking about. We either do that through a name. Well, where did my cursor go? Yeah, we either do that through a name, image name here, or through an ID. Every image and every container is auto-generated uh, an ID. 
this ID is, is extremely long, but fortunately we only need to specify just enough of it to be unique. So if you only have one container running and it starts with an F, then you can just put docker tag F <laughs> and then that's good enough to specify what image you're talking about. Uh, if it has a name, e.g. I've tagged it in the past and it's been given a name, I can say docker tag, you know, whatever name I wanted. Uh, or Docker's run whatever name. So we either do things by name or by ID. Um, and again, it just has to be enough of the ID to be unique. Any questions here? Okay. So uh, working with containers, uh, I'm going to show you kind of a little bit of this, but uh, we're going to show, show you how to start and stop a container. We're going to talk about volume mounts. We're going to talk about different types of networking. And we're going to talk about a utility called Docker Compose coming up here. So, <clears throat> starting to stop a container. We've already done this halfway. We've already started running one. But it's simple as docker run, giving it the params we want, the image, and the command. Uh, and then when we're done with the container, we say docker stop. We can either pass the name or ID, and it stops the container. We can then start the container again with docker start, name or ID, and it starts the container back up. So, um, actually we're gonna do that real quick. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to do docker images. I kinda get a list of images and I can see, uh, oh, I don't see, oh, this would be interesting. Docker run, and let me do minus it. What that means is <clears throat> I want the uh, when, I, when I start the container, I want to be in interactive mode, e.g. I want to automatically attach to that container. And the T basically says, I want this Docker uh, instance to have a terminal, because not everything needs a terminal, so not all, all the time do they allocate a terminal for it. But let me say, I want a terminal. And let me do uh, Microsoft Windows Server Core. And then I'm going to do command.exe. So this should run. So it's going to pull that. Oops. Hey, this is a good good segue here. So it's basically saying uh, operating system Windows cannot be used on this platform. Right now, uh, I'm running all this on Windows, right? Right now I'm in Linux mode, so everything that's happening over here in my Docker land is kind of a Linux container. <coughs> I need to switch to Windows container before I can base something off of Windows. So the way I do that is gotta stop the presentation or the slideshow. Sorry. Okay. So <clears throat> now I'm gonna also say this is for on desktop. So on desktop I'm going to have this option. So I'm gonna come here, it's gonna be this little Docker guy, and I'm gonna be able to say switch to Windows containers. And it basically says you're about to switch. Anything that's running is gonna continue running, whether it's Windows or Linux, but all the uh, <clears throat> all the uh, new commands are going to be again running against Windows containers. Uh, on Windows Server 2016, it works differently. It's kind of built into OS more than an application, so I don't really have that option to, to swap back and forth like that in, in a tray. So just kind of be beware of that. Um, so it should have switched by now, so I should be able to grab my command and, and run it again. Maybe. Well, Should it says running. Mine's always switched that quick, but maybe got it. Oh, it, it just went and happened. So yeah, actually, right now I am inside of a Docker. Um, Docker image. So uh, I can do DIR, you'll see there's really nothing in here. <laughs> it's because it's a very minimal installation. If I go to users, I don't really have anything in here. <coughs> so my command prompt is actually inside of a Docker image right now. In fact, if I pop open my task manager right here, um, and I go to details, Yes, I run a lot of Chrome. Uh, I may have to order, let's see, it's already ordered by name. So let's see, get past all the Chromes. There we go. And then 
<clears throat> one of these command.exes is actually running inside the container and I'm not sure which one <laughs> could be one of these there's actually a new column to help you figure that out I don't remember which one it is though But I mean, the kind of the point of this is it's kind of hard to figure out, right? Uh, kind of hard to figure out what's running in containers and what's not because they just kind of everything runs side by side. Although, if I were to do like a net stat here, this is just going to show me what's running inside of this container. Has no idea what's running on the host, and each container would be perfectly isolated from the other. So, <coughs> uh, then when I'm well, let me do this. Let me grab another com command prompt here for a second. If I were to do docker ps now, I can see I am running command.exe, right? And when I say exit, that was my entry point. So now when I come over here and do docker ps, it doesn't show anything. ps minus a is going to show that. I had a lot of things running, but most, at least <laughs> the most recent one was that uh, command AC. So a couple of other things to note while we're looking here. Here's the container ID it created for that container. Also, it did assign it a random name. Since I didn't bother to specify what name I would like for that container, it creates kind of a random name. Uh, Cranky Dykstra, that's a great one. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, there's there's different names that it just kind of automatically creates. In uh, in typical usage, though, in production, you'd want to probably specify the name. But there we go. Uh, so let's do this one more time. So I'm going to run the same command over here. It's going to take a second. Over here, I'm going to clear my screen okay so docker ps you can see it's running I'm going to do something a little unorthodox I'm going to close that window so docker ps it's still running oh shoot I want to get back to that command how do I do it right so I can just do docker attach e I could do e7 I could do ea I only need an e there's only one thing running so Doker. Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> oh, did find multiple E's. Okay, so let's see. E7. There's probably some stopped ones. And I'm probably already attached. Yeah, there I am. I'm back in. Uh, another handy thing to do is uh, so I'm gonna, let me pull that trick again. So I'm going to close that. Okay, so let me do docker ps to get my ID. So this time I want to do uh, docker exec. So what this is going to do is rather than attaching to what's already running on console, I'm going to create another process running inside of that container. So I'm going to say I want to exec IT, it's going to be IC, then I want to do it on E7. So what I'm saying is I want to run interactive terminal I want to run this command exe inside of container e7 oops have those backwards my bad sorry live demos and all right here we go and there we go uh, this is a different terminal than the other one uh, both of them are in the same container so they have the same like if I uh, let's see See. I say go to both containers. See that file? They're both they're both running in kind of that same container. So we can have multiple processes running in, inside of those. This is very helpful for troubleshooting sometimes. So for example, when running ASP.NET, ASP.NET core inside of a Docker container kind of runs as a, as a, a command line 
that just kind of blocks until the thing is shut down. Uh, if I want to get in there and I want to troubleshoot a little bit, like I'm, maybe I can't find a file, maybe I want to see you know, what it has for environment variables, whatever, I can do a Docker exec, just get a command line, get in there and kind of see what's going on. So I use that command a lot. Another one we use a lot, so let me get out of the Docker instance here. Another one we use a lot is uh, Docker logs E7. That's going to show me what has been pushed to the console uh, since that image has been started. You can see I have that uh, that's the last thing that was pushed on the console, so that's the last thing I see. Um, and if I were to, if I had the other window open, I could show you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but anything like uh, if, uh, again, back to ASP.NET Core, ASP.NET Core is going to be spewing to the console often any kind of errors you're, you're encountering. We see that spewage through Docker logs without having to actually attach and run the risk of accidentally downing that image, so, or con the container. All right, uh, any questions on that? How does, uh, for the images, is there any licensing issues? Like, you know, you're running the server core right there. Do you have, I mean, does Microsoft enforce anything with that? Or? So server core is okay to run because it's meant to be run with Docker. Um, essentially, you can't run it without a Windows license anyway, so they figure you're, you're going to be fine. Uh, Windows Server Core image doesn't run on Linux, so uh, no, they're not worried about licensing there, but perhaps potentially. So, for example, um, <coughs> SQL Server. There's an image for SQL Server. Basically, uh, for that though, you have to apply. You have to supply a license key as a environment variable or command parameter or something, uh, and that's how you can run those. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's ways around it. Also, there's no you know requirement that they publish. A Docker image of SQL Server to Docker Hub, but if you wanted to take a, a Docker image and you wanted to add your version of SQL Server to it and save it to your repository, there's nothing preventing you from doing that. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions? Cool. All right, let's move on. Okay, we we talked about interacting with the containers with the Docker exec. Uh, Mounting volumes. Okay, so <clears throat> one thing we, we kind of often want to do is we want to be able to share um, data between the host and a running container because by default any any file system <clears throat> activity that happens inside of the container is contained within the container. E.g. if I go in my container and I delete the operating system files I'm obviously not sabotaging the host I'm just deleting it in my container. It doesn't doesn't do anything to the host. Um, but if there was a, a time where I need files to be kind of synchronized between the two, or or rather turn off redirection, if you will, uh, such that I get to real file system uh, data, that can be done with volume mounts. Uh, that's there's kind of two main syntaxes for it. There's a simple syntax where I basically say oh, I'm not going to try to write it, but there's a syntax where I can basically say uh, on the host. In, I want this directory colon uh, container directory. So if I want to map, you know, C data files to uh, inside the container instead, I want it to be C app data. I can do that just a colon and do the two. <clears throat> if I want to have a share that's available to multiple containers, the best way to do that is to alias that share. So instead of saying I want to share this path to this path. I just basically share, say, I want to take this alias and I want it in this path. Later on, you'd say that alias maps to this uh, directory. The reason we do that is uh, <clears throat> if we want multiple containers to access that share, it's a more coordinated way so they don't stump on each other's toes and, and cause problems. And also, we can easily change what that is in one place rather than having to change it multiple places. So uh, that's volume mounts. Networking. Networking is kind of a complex concept in Docker, and frankly one I still haven't fully grasped. Um, so there are different networking modes that can be applied, and there's different uh, privileges between different sets of containers, and again, I, I don't fully understand it myself, but I'll tell you what I do know. So what I do know is that bridge slash NAT networking is a default. What that does is 
it creates kind of a virtual network device for the host OS, sorry, for the uh, container OS, and it allows it to get a, uh, a natted IP address. These will be like 172.16 type IP addresses. Those IP addresses uh, are set up with a, a gateway that when you uh, hit the gateway, it's actually the, the host host that's going to get that and it's going to then redirect the NAT out to the internet. Um, so when you work with Docker containers, you'll see a lot of times where you have 172.16 or 17224. It kind of gets a random IP address each time it, you uh, spin up that container. You can't specify it though. <clears throat> Uh, another one is host. So we have this actually option available for not just networking, but for file system and process isolation. You can basically say, I want to basically turn off the redirection for this layer. When I set networking to host, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying deal with the host uh, network directly. Don't try and uh, redirect it at all. Um, that would be beneficial if we're gonna run something just like it's running on the actual machine. <clears throat> Uh, another one is kind of an overlay. The overlay network is useful for if I'm running in a swarm and I've got five different hosts, but they all want to be part of that same network so the, the uh, containers between them can communicate. So that would be the, the overlay. <clears throat> the Mac VLAN is one where rather than setting an IP address, it's basically just letting it, uh, just giving it a new Mac address and it's going to worry about getting its own IP address from the, the network and everything. So it's still virtualized, so it's not host, but it's going to act as, this, as though it's its own network interface. And that's very handy for uh, if you've got uh, different apps you're trying to Dockerize that aren't used to being in Docker. Uh, then there's none, e.g. we don't need to have a network uh, supplied to the Docker container. And then there's also plugins, so if you needed something specialized, we could create a driver for it. Um, one thing I wanted to mention before we move on is the, the bridge NAT. Um, it does allow, you notice, for example, in the MQ, <coughs> we had expose and we had the different ports to expose. The bridge NAT allows us to um, bind uh, these different ports to the host in, on certain uh, host ports. So if I did that and I bound, um, you know, port 80 on my uh, host to port 80 on my uh, container, then port 80 is going to be listening on the host and you'll be able to send and receive traffic through it on the host. The caveat is you only get one binding per port on the host. If you use 80, then you're kind of screwed. And we'll get to how you get around that later, but um, that can be useful if you needed to map things back to the host, you can map these ports. If you expose them without mapping them, it actually picks a random free port, um, which sounds like it's not particularly useful, but we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> Questions about networking? All right. So um, last thing to talk about before I, I show you uh, a little bit more demo is Docker Compose. So while we have these Docker files, um, it, it may sound kind of strange to you at first, but your application probably isn't going to exist in a single Docker image. Your application is probably going to exist among several Docker images. You're probably going to have uh, different things as <clears throat> uh, services to spin up. So for example, a very common thing is if I need a database, mm -hmm. often what I'd do is I would specify that I want a container to be brought up. Maybe you uh, maybe want SQL Express, maybe I want uh, my SQL, something like that. Uh, I would pull that up under a, its own Docker container and my container would simply communicate with that container. And so that's a very common thing to have happen. With microservices as well, each part of the micro, of the, the application could be a different microservices. So for example, a couple of the applications we've written now, or recently, uh, there would be like seven or eight containers each to deploy the application because they're separated into microservices. They have a database dependency. In a lot of cases, they have RabbitMQ as a dependency. So all those things kind of get spun up in their own containers. And the way we orchestrate that is <clears throat> one way. One way to orchestrate that is with Docker Compose. So Docker Compose is 
really just kind of doing a couple of little things for us. It's it's a YML file, which is basically, it's kind of like uh, XML file, but we instead of using tags, we use white space. <laughs> is that a good description of it? Yeah. Um, There you go, Python and Markup Languages like that. Uh, it creates container groupings. So uh, if we have a, a group of containers that need to be able to talk to each other, this is the easiest way to provision so they can communicate with one another via network, for example. Uh, and it's simply doing the docker run command, but all of the, it gets kind of cumbersome. All of the expose parts of the arguments in the run command that gets long. The volume mounts are also arguments. They get long. The environment is another set of arguments that get long. By the time you're done with, actually if you try to do it in a docker run command, it's, it's going to be a very long, lengthy command. Uh, the docker compose basically takes the XML and pre-generates that command for you. And so you can just worry about keeping it a nice, clean XML markup. Here's the stuff I need. And it translates it into docker run commands. <coughs> Uh, then there's docker compose down. Docker compose down will stop all the containers running in that group and it deletes those containers. Yes, it deletes them. That is on purpose, but I want you to make, make sure you understand that this is a, a common uh, rookie mistake is thinking that now I have a container up, that container is permanent, right? I'm always going to be able to, I mean, put, be able to put my data there. I'm, I'm just going to move into that container. Don't make that mistake. Anything you need to persist, do it through a, a, a volume share, do it through something else. Don't put data in the container and expect it to live there forever. And the reason that is the case is uh, Docker is about DevOps. We're going to get newer images of this application eventually, right? How exactly are we going to apply the newer image to the old data? I mean, that just doesn't make a lot of sense, right? The way we do that is we delete all the old containers we start up new containers with the new image and then we can access the data we need to, to, to run our app. So uh, yeah, Docker Compose down deletes your containers. <laughs> They're gone forever. So uh, just FYI. Okay, so let's, let's do a little bit of a demo here. So let's do first kind of a show and tell. I happen to have over here a Docker Compose file. Yay! All right, so okay. Uh, so in Docker Compose, we often specify which version of compatibility we need for the Docker Compose syntax. I'm specifying I want 3.4, and then I kind of have things nested. So the way it works is uh, everything that is now tabbed under this services thing here is going to be part of that services. You can see uh, VS Code is kind of helpful in kind of saying, yeah, see. There's services, and it goes clear down. Um, and then we kind of have two spaces, and um, I lament, lament, lament that I can't use tabs in this file. I am a tabber. I turn change all of my settings to, to use tabs every time. And the fact that I can't use tabs instead of spaces in a YML file makes me want to kick somebody. Like, I'm going to pull request somebody, use tabs. I mean, even Python, which is a white space based language, allows you to use tabs. I mean, there's no reason for it. Just makes me mad, sorry. Rent and rent. <laughs> All right, so uh, the services is gonna basically say, I'm going to list a bunch of things I need to start running when we start this. So uh, the first of, of which is RabbitMQ. This is kind of just an arbitrary tag, I'm just saying, this is the section for RabbitMQ. This is the name of my image, essentially. Then I say what image I want to run. I say what I want the container to be named. Rather than auto naming it, like we got the, uh, what was that, silly dyke straw or something like that. Instead, we, we're going to actually specify our name. Uh, we can specify the host name. And this is really important uh, for later when we want to uh, proxy, reverse proxy into these containers. This is very important. Uh, we can specify a restart policy. So the repart restart policies are kind of uh, neat, especially in production. Basically what this is saying is that if my container stops for any reason, except for me explicitly stopping it, I want it to start back. And there's several restart policies available. 
Uh, there's like, for example, restart always. So if, even if somebody does say stop on the container, it's, it's just going to start it back up again. Um, <clears throat> this is basically saying that uh, we want to be able to uh, have, this is like the equivalent of the I on the, when we did Docker run IT. This is the equivalent. We, wanna, we want to do uh, standard in. Uh, the TTY is basically saying that the T part of it, I want a, I want a terminal. Okay, and then here are the ports. So the ports come in these octets or, sorry, not octets, tuples of values. So I can specify wait, what port I want on this side, on the host side, and then what port I'm mapping to on the container side. Or if I don't specify and I just put the one, it knows that it's going to take this port on the container and map it to some random port on the host. Um, so that's what the ports are doing there. Environment is specifying further environment variables. Here you can see we're passing in a user and a password. Uh, and then here's my volumes. So you'll notice I actually did go ahead and alias this volume. And so that whatever this data volume is, which will be defined later, is going to mount to C data on the container. So when this is up and running, if I go to C data, anything where it is, where that volume mount is, goes there. And, and more on that in a minute. Okay, so here's my next container. Uh, it's SQL Server. I'm saying I want it to based off of Microsoft's SQL Server for Windows Express. I'm going to name it this container name. I'm going to name it this host name. Give this restart policy. I want to map the ports that way. Uh, I have to accept the EULA this way. I have to specify an SA password. And then this attached DBs is, so remember how I was telling you never save anything in, in there that you want deleted. This is how I can say I've got this database. I want it to be named this and it's going to have you know these these files at the, these locations on the container. So you'll notice that my data volume is, is mapped to C temp and that's where I'm, I'm telling it to look for these MDF or sorry yeah MDF files. So it's basically saying go to these these lo file locations to mount the database. It's very handy. It's a very uh, neat way to do that. Uh, and then it's all the same all the way down. So we've got another one. This one's uh, based off an image that we build and put in there. Another thing we can put here is we can tell it what the Docker file location is. So if it doesn't find the image in our uh, list of images, it's going to actually build a new version of that image and then be able to pull it and run it. Um, and this is kind of more of the same. So I've got a bunch of these services, right? Depends on, this is a neat thing, I can say my container depends on this other container. And what that will do is it'll bring the containers up in the right order in order to satisfy all the dependencies. So I can be guaranteed that the SQL Server container, for example, is up before my container is even started. And let's see. Okay, and then over here I basically say a volume is data volume. I didn't specify where I wanted data volume to live, and if you do that, it actually kind of goes to a default location. And this is kind of a, an unknown secret of Docker, but C program data Docker. This is where everything Docker actually lives. And if I go under the uh, volumes, Yeah, yeah, volumes, okay. Well, I don't have it in here. I must not have run it recently or ever on here. Then I would have a directory for that data volume and say data volume or whatever. Maybe have a hash with it. And then all my files are actually inside of there. Um, <clears throat> so other things I have here that are kind of interesting to look at, my images actually kind of fit in here. My containers, these are all the data for the containers. Um, and also things like logs. So the logs are in here as well. So everything everything Docker data related ends up kind of in this kind of this location. This. Um, let's see. Any questions on Docker composes? Awesome. Could you map, use a network endpoint, an SMB endpoint in there to share your data? It won't take that, uh, but there's nothing keeping you inside a Docker image from hitting an SMB endpoint. 
So if you need an SMB endpoint, what I'd probably do is I'd maybe share the location of the endpoint as an environment variable. And then inside your app, just kind of go look there for that endpoint. Okay. Uh, container managers. So um, Docker had, kind of has this uh, notion of, of swarms. So a swarm is no more or less than a bunch of hosts that are all kind of banding together. So when I say I want to run a container, rather than saying I want to run a container on that host right there, you say I want to run a container into this swarm. The swarm decides which machine is best to run it on. So we'll pick one of the machines. Additionally, if one of those machines fails, uh, it automatically rolls onto another machine. So swarm is really kind of a real cool feature of Docker. Um, another thing that we can do if we set it up via um, one of these container managers is, oops, I did a circle. Let me try that again. One of the things we can do with one of these with one of these container managers is we can kind of look at resource usage on a Docker container, and we can decide based off of that uh, whether we need to spin more up or we need to spin them down. Um, so all three of these provide that kind of functionality. Um, there's also other cool features that they can provide. I didn't show you Docker stats. Next time we do a demo, remind me I'll do that. But Docker stats will kind of show you this container and this container only uses, you know, has used this much disk space, this much I/O, this much uh, network. So it Docker is kind of keeping track per container. Uh, like if your CPU usage is pegged in that container, it will tell you this container is using a lot of CPU. Those these tools use that information to make the decisions about. Uh, whether it's to spin up or spin down more of those copy instances of those containers. Um, so let's see. So I, I promise you to get, get here, and, and here we are. So let me describe kind of a little bit about how this kind of works. Uh, at least this will give me a little bit of doctrine of Nate, so you can take, take it with a grain of salt. But uh, in, in these Docker hosts, the idea is install nothing on them but docker so uh, don't install anything uh, just base OS and, and docker and that the reason for that is when we add a host to a, a swarm we want to make that process as easy as possible and there's also not a lot of reason to need to add anything to the actual host OS anything we need we can accomplish through docker even if it means uh, using a Docker image that has host level access. So for example, uh, we could, in theory, take that Windows Server core and we could uh, essentially just say, I want to put IIS on top of that as a Docker image. And then we can use the IIS to, you, to route, route uh, traffic between the other containers. We just have to give that particular instance of IIS host access to the network then it can do what it needs to. Um, so typical uh, things that we, we do uh, for on Linux when we have uh, we have a, a Docker server and we just want to kind of host images out of it. Uh, we have something called Docker Gen, and Docker Gen is a program that uh, it's open source is available. What it does is it listens from Docker for uh, container start and container stop commands. <coughs> When it hears a container start command, it looks to see if it's got environment variables configured for Docker Gen. And what it will do is take those uh, environment variables and create, uh, or update, sorry, uh, a, oh, what's it called? One of those, conf a configuration file for Nginx. So it's going to update the Nginx configuration file to now include, hey, we have this new container. This is its URL. This is its port. This is where you, how you get to it. And by the way, Nginx, I need you to reload your config because we've changed it. So simply by simply by starting containers or stopping containers, we can automatically have all of that uh, host setup done automatically for us. Uh, additionally, we can say uh, when we start up more and more containers, we can tell Nginx to load balance across them. Um, the reason I'm talking about Nginx and, and uh, reverse proxy is because uh, that's the typical way we deploy uh, websites in, in Docker. Like I said before, if we tried to bind it straight to the, the port 80 on the host, we only get one container that gets to bind to that one port 80, 
and then we're done. That's it. That's all. By allowing a reverse proxy, uh, we can do a couple things. One, we can do load balancing between different containers, even if those containers aren't necessarily on that current machine. Uh, we can do um, dynamic configuration, where, like I said, when we pull the, the, we start up that container, it automatically knows, hey, I need to get this URL mapped in the, in the host files. Um, we get some advantage in terms of potentially caching. We could tell Nginx, that, hey, why don't you just start caching any of those, you know, font files, for example. Um, so there's a lot of good things about having kind of reverse proxy in front of our application. Um, not the least of which is uh, it's the only way it kind of really works in Docker. Um, it's important for that web server to be able to see the host headers in order to make the routing determination of which Docker containers to go to. Docker containers don't get that kind of uh, information until it's too late. So it's kind of the really only way to, it can function. So while we probably use Nginx as a reverse proxy on Linux, on Windows we use IIS. IIS is perfectly capable of doing reverse proxy. We just have a couple of requirements. We have to install ARR, which is uh, Application Request Routing. We do that through the web platform tools. Uh, then we URL rewrite is a uh, prerequisite for ARR, so we're probably going to get both. And then <coughs> um, we, can, we can create reverse proxy configurations. Um, I'm not going to show you how to do that today, but maybe uh, I was thinking about doing a blog post or something about how to do it, so maybe if we do, we'll post on the channel. The last thing I'm going to say is um, <clears throat> right now, uh, while Docker on Linux is, is quite stable, quite mature, Docker on Windows is maturing still. That is to say, um, <clears throat> the desktop version of Windows 10 actually has more features than Windows Server 2016 has currently. That's The gap is quick, quickly closing, Windows is catching up, but one of the things that uh, you can do on Windows 10 that you can't do on Windows Server 2016 is actually mapping the host ports. So you know how I was telling you we can map port 80 on the host to port 80 on the, on the Docker container? That does not yet work in Windows Server 2016. You must reverse proxy. You can't expose anything. Um, and that's kind of a good thing. I mean, security-wise, that's actually kind of a benefit. Um, but the secret here is, uh, it's kind of interesting. When you reverse proxy, uh, you're actually going to tell whatever the reverse proxy is to hit one of those NATed IP addresses, right? So it's going to be like 172.16, whatever, port 80. Only that host can hit that IP, or only the host in that uh what are they called? The network swarm thing? Boy, you have to edit that before you put it on YouTube. <laughs> Question I saw hand. So can you, instead of the bridge NAT, can you use just the host networking? You you get your own IP on the, the LAN that, that the same, you know, that's, that, and you need, then you have a port 80 per container. Don't so you? if you use host networking, you're not going to get your own IP. You're going to be using the same IP as the host has. Uh, if you want your own IP, that was a different uh, configuration. But um, yeah, uh, the problem is some of those aren't even implemented. In fact, I think the the host is only one. Sorry, host and uh, the NAT one are the only ones implemented on Windows currently. And none. And none. That's right. Um, so yeah, but it's not going to be long now. The the newest version of uh, Windows kernel for 2016 does have most of this available. It's just it's the headless version of it only and most people are running a headed version, yada yada. So, um, Okay, last thing worth mentioning. Uh, there is entire suites of software dedicated to passing secrets to Docker like those passwords. If you are uncomfortable having your password in clear text in a Docker config someplace, you don't have to deal with that. Uh, banks and uh, healthcare organizations, for example, forbid such practices, so you have to use a, a secret manager. <clears throat> but those are ubiquitous, not a big deal. Um, we can, if we make changes to a Docker container, commit those back to an image. Again, that's kind of not the way we should be creating images. We should be creating images from a Docker file each and every time. But let's say you have something legacy, you don't really care about it too much. Uh, I think it's a perfectly acceptable things and 
a thing to do in some certain situations. Um, you'll soon be able to run Linux and Windows containers <clears throat> more side by side. So right now I have to switch, now I'm doing Linux, now I'm doing uh, Windows containers on my Windows. Soon inside the same Docker Compose I could put Linux images and Windows images <clears throat> inside the same file and it just figures out which one it needs and runs that kind. And that's coming very soon. Um, in the future, they're, they're working to expand what they're doing with Docker. So, for example, in the future, we'll be able to have GUIs exposed through Docker. That would be kind of cool because that would really redefine an app install uh, to simply mean pull the image, run the image, and it's installed, right? Uh, Cross-platform could be kind of taken to another way, level that way as well. So I'm kind of excited for, for that notion. I think that's quite a bit further down the horizon. Right now, Docker's sweet spot is microservices. Right? We put our microservices in Docker. Uh, and last but not least, it, it takes practice. Uh, all these commands I told you, you're going to forget unless you go and you start using them. So I'd encourage you to you know, pick it up and start running it. Um, Docker <coughs> has been catching fire at an incredible rate. I have, a, I have an article up on my desktop. I was going to reference it, but it's actually a few years old. It was saying that there's a 3,300% increase in Docker uh, adoptance between the years 2015 and 2016. Of course, that's that's then. I think it's even accelerating more now. It's it's really odd for us here at Mindfire to start a new project and not expect it to be a containerized project. That would just be really odd for us. <clears throat> so, I mean, everything's kind of moving that way. If you're moving to the cloud it makes things really easy. You, Amazon AWS has extensive support for Docker, as does Azure. <clears throat> uh, they have their own management tools outside of the uh, Kubernetes and those others. Um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that every dev is going to need to know, so you might as well just bite the bullet and do it, right? So, question. Yeah, what about those of us who are not running Have problems with running in Docker? Probably not. No. The framework will deploy there. Your framework should should deploy there. If you can't run in Windows Server Core, there is a full version of Windows Server available to run on. It's kind of a crappy alternative because it's much much larger image, 13 gig, uh, but it's an entire version of Windows. So anything that runs on Windows will run on it. So. I was reading today that .NET 4.7, the 10 gig image file. <laughs> Other questions? All right, well, that's all I've got. Yeah. <laughs>